Hiya folks, welcome to the show. My name's The Gladding Gladiator and it's my mission to info dump about everything Disney animation on the internet. So it's that special time of year once again. The streets are filled with song, flashing lights give me sensory overload, and Amazon is no doubt making a killing despite the awful way they treat their workers. Proving once and for all that no matter how much we fight in this world, nothing will ever really change and the general public will continue to consume guiltlessly. And speaking of evil entities that make a fortune and are slowly taking over the world, I guess I should finally talk about Frozen. Disney's Frozen is a 2013 animated motion picture loosely based on Hans Christian Andersen's The Snow Queen that was the 53rd feature length production by Walt Disney Animation Studios. It's the story of two sisters, Queen Elsa and Princess Anna of Arendelle, who have spent most of their lives separated from each other due to Elsa being born with the power to create ice and snow and having accidentally injured Anna when they were younger. On the day of Elsa's coronation, her powers are revealed, causing her to go into self-imposed exile unknowingly creating an eternal winter in the process. Anna then ventures into the mountains to bring her sister home and save her kingdom. Teaming up with Ice Cutter and Exuder of much himbo energy Kristoff, his emotional support reindeer Sven, and a magical snowman named Olaf who is the childhood creation of the sisters. Along the way they come across many colourful personalities, such as Disney's original first gay character, a group of rock trolls who don't understand the concept of personal boundaries, and a villain who exists purely to subvert the nice guy trope and doesn't really have a discernible personality of his own. When Frozen was initially announced in December 2011, many were expecting it to just be another Disney movie. But there is not a soul in the multiverse who could have predicted what was about to happen next. From the moment Frozen was released, it blew up, overnight becoming a worldwide phenomenon the likes of which Disney hadn't seen since The Lion King. Critics and audiences adored the film for its stellar music, innovative visuals, lovable characters, self-aware humour, great dialogue, subversive story and message about the love between sisters. In just over a few weeks, Frozen had grossed over one billion dollars and became a merchandising juggernaut. Even today, Elsa and Anna have never needed to be indoctrinated into the Disney princess brand because Frozen became so big it was a franchise onto itself. The world was alight with Frozen fever and whether we liked it or not, no one was able to let it go. But this was 2013 well into the peak of the modern internet, so people can't just like things, especially not a level I don't think is acceptable. So the only logical conclusion was that Frozen is an overhyped dumpster fire and anyone who enjoys it is an idiot who represents everything wrong with society. Yeah, it took no time for a huge backlash to start forming around this movie just because people enjoyed it. In a few days, Frozen went from being this glorious new beginning to a new age of Disney to the worst thing to ever happen. People's main arguments were the songs were overplayed and they couldn't go anywhere without seeing the merchandise, so let's quickly address that. While, yes, the songs from Frozen were played a lot and the brand was everywhere and completely inescapable, how is that any different to The Little Mermaid, or Beauty and the Beast, or Aladdin, or The Lion King? Because, yes, those movies were also once plastered across the face of the earth. The only reason Frozen seems bigger is is because, again, this is the age of the modern internet where everything online is ludicrously amplified. But let me stress, if you dislike Frozen, more power to you. Just have an actual valid reason for disliking the movie itself instead of blanket arguments that don't hold much water. Point is, people didn't just dislike Frozen, they hated it, and anything connected to it. And too bad for them because this franchise was only getting started, with an abundance of TV specials, shorts, theme park attractions, stage shows, and enough toys to block out the song. Fast forward two years to February 2015, and Disney announces they're working on a new Frozen Christmas special to air on ABC, which would later be titled Olaf's Frozen Adventure. Now, it would be expected that a lot of people would just write off this special and ignore it. But this seemingly harmless holiday story would go on to become the most abhorred piece of Frozen content in the entire franchise, and mostly for reasons out of its control. 
In June 2017, it was announced the executives had decided that this special was too cinematic for television. And I'm sure that was the sole reason, and it had nothing to do with wanting to put new Frozen content behind a paywall instead of just staring it on TV. So now, Olaf's Frozen Adventure would receive a limited theatrical release premiering in front of Pixar's latest animated feature, Coco, which at that time was only a few months away from release. Now, that doesn't seem like a big deal. I mean, it wouldn't be the first time Disney put a 20 minute shot in front of a movie's theatrical run. They first ventured into this practice with Mickey's Christmas Carol, which was shown in front of reissues of both Jungle Book and The Rescuers in 1983. And they did it again with The Prince and the Pauper in 1990, which was shown in front of The Rescuers Down Under. And both those featurettes are iconic beloved classics today. So this should all still be fine. Oh, wait. Internet. People were furious that not only was a 20 minute short playing in front of Coco, but that it was frozen. There were cries from those that thought they had walked into the wrong movie, even though all they had to do was check their tickets. Also, did they really think Disney would just shadow drop a new Frozen sequel with barely any marketing? And those circumstances very much coloured people's views of this special. While after four years the fiery hatred has certainly died down, there is still a lot of resentment held towards it. So when all is said and done, was the unbridled hatred truly warranted, or have people been overlooking what is really a fun and sweet story that perfectly encapsulates the warmth and sentimentality this time of year brings? Only one way to find out. We open in Arendelle, as the kingdom is decorating for the season and enjoying the snow which isn't a life-threatening curse from their queen. We get formally reintroduced to everyone's favourite least favourite snowman who still easily ranks near the top in terms of Disney sidekicks as he keeps jump scaring the castle staff. Cut to the hall as Anna enters and becomes Olaf's latest victim. As Elsa comes in wearing a fabulous new ensemble, we learn the sisters have planned a surprise party for the people of Arendelle that will commence once the Yule Bell rings. The excitement is too much for them as they burn First out in our opening song, Ring in the Season, the first of six original songs written for the special. Now, as of this time, this is the only chapter in the Frozen franchise in which the music wasn't helmed by Bobby Lopez and Kristen Anderson Lopez. Likely because when this was in production, the duo would have been working on both Coco and Frozen 2. Our various assortment of laments and ballads were this time spearheaded by Elisa Samsel and Kate Anderson with this being their first time writing music for such a high-level production. Following this, the two would go on to work on the music for the Apple TV original Central Park, which, if you haven't seen it, it's one of the best animated shows out there at the moment, with drop-dead gorgeous character animation and irresistibly catchy songs delivered by an all-star cast of Broadway and film icons. Though, being fully honest, it's near impossible to tell the difference, as Elisa and Kate captured that frozen sound and feel to the music, as every single song in this special knocks it out of the park in terms of clever lyrics, atmosphere, and emotion. Ring in the Season is a great opening number that tells us this is the first Christmas since the castle opened its gates again, placing this story a mere few months after the first Frozen film, as we'll be somewhat exploring the awkwardness that still lingers between Elsa and Anna after spending most of their lives apart, as they now feel a desperate need to make up for lost time. Christoph Sven arrive with the Yule Bell and set it into place. The sisters ring the bell, officially commencing the festivities. There's just one issue. <laughs> Surprise! Uh-oh. You're welcome to join us in the castle if you'd like. We wouldn't want to intrude on your family traditions. Oh, so the surprise is everyone left. Kristoff intrudes on the moment to introduce them to a troll tradition called the Ballad of Flemingrad. And this is what I really love about the supplementary Frozen stuff. Just scenes of this family interacting and living their lives, which is something we don't get too much of from the movies because there's always calls to action and trauma to deal with. Now you lick his forehead and make a wish. Who's next? You're a princess, you don't have to settle. Kristoff leaves to make his traditional Flemmy stew, because it wouldn't be frozen if Kristoff didn't get pushed to the sidelines as soon as possible. Elsa, Anna and Olaf re-enter the hall which has since grown dimmer to help with the symbolism, as Elsa and Anna come to the realisation they don't have any holiday traditions through an emotional reprise of Ring in the Season. Elsa leaves blaming herself and in a heart-wrenching moment unintentionally closes the door on her sister once again. Maybe that's their Christmas tradition. Jokes aside, I really 
really do love this moment. The moment of reflection and pain on Anna's face as the door shuts on her, as if all those painful memories she thought she'd gotten past came flooding back. It's always the little moments that show how much love a team had for what they were making, and this continuation of the character arcs from the first movie already puts this far above the quick cash grab many people write this off as. Olaf watches Anna leave and gets an idea. He and Sven will go door to door to learn about as many family traditions as possible so he can bring the best one back to Anna and Elsa. And again, it's the little touches. Following the first house, which makes candy canes, we start our next song, That Time of Year. Which, I imagine because it's the goofy Olaf song, will be the most polarising track, but I can't help but love it. The way the door knocking is incorporated into the music, the witty and clever lyrics, Josh Gad's usual cadence in his performance. You cut down a tree, and then you dress its corpse with candles. I... <laughs> And also, can we just appreciate the visuals? It's Walt Disney Animation, so of course it was always going to look very polished. But just look at the detail on those doors! All the imperfections in the wood, the texture of the snow. I can sort of understand why this was deemed too cinematic for television, as this featurette looks better than the original movie. The final house Olaf visits is a callback. As we finally get to see the inside of Oak and Sauna, which is more than enough reason to justify this special's existence. We also get a closer look at his relatives, and I'm surprised I have never seen a single theory that Kristoff is the lost child of this family. But I guess I shouldn't really be spoiling the plot of Frozen 3. Oaken gives him his own sauna and sends them on their way. Would it be possible to get one of those awkwardly revealing yet tastefully traditional towels your family is so fond of wearing? Take mine, yeah? Still warm. While Olaf is celebrating his 100% flawless infallible plan, he accidentally sets fire to the traditions, causing them to lose control of their sleigh, and this scene definitely gives me the vibes of those 2000s gimmick movies or theme park attractions that only existed to shove 3D in your face. Actually, why hasn't there been a Frozen simulation ride yet? The person at Disney that definitely watches my videos, take notes because I am giving you gold here. Olaf and Sven get separated on opposite sides of the cliff as the sleigh falls into the chasm, and we're about halfway through the special, so now's probably a good time to check in on our two favourite marketing strategies. I mean sisters. Elsa heads to Anna's room to apologise for earlier, only to find it's empty. She finds her sibling in the attic looking for their traditions, as we once again have to be reminded of how awful Elsa's childhood was, as her chest is filled with nothing but gloves. Well, almost. Who's this little guy? Oh, Sir Jorgen Bjorgen. He was a really good listener. I'm fine. I'm fine. Just, just keep going. The two then stumble across an old box which contains something that shocks Anna. Back to the forest as Olaf is trying to salvage what he can from the traditions. Good thing fruitcake is the strongest substance known to man. At least the cockroaches will have lots of food when the apocalypse finally stops taking its sweet time and gets here already. Side note, is fruitcake an actual thing? Because every single Christmas special in existence has made mention of it, but I have never seen one in real life. I know that makes me a fake Christmas fan, but really? I is that just an American thing? And if it is, follow-up question, if you know everyone hates it, why do you keep making it? So Olaf ventures into the woods. Hopefully he doesn't run into James Corden. And everyone who is familiar with the first Frozen movie, which is about 110% of all life on Earth, likely has some idea where this is going. Oh, so Sven runs back to the castle. Oh, hey Kristoff. Nice of you to show up again before the final act. <laughs> No, Olaf's lost in the forest and being chased by hungry wolves? <laughs> yeah, obviously. So Olaf is running through the woods and thanks to his nifty ability to split apart into several small choking hazards, is able to escape. A tradition is saved! And for the first time, Olaf can't find a bright side and sinks into a melancholic mood while delivering a devastating reprise of that time of year. <sighs> Maybe I should just stay lost. Elsa and Anna alert the kingdom and soon everyone is out searching for Olaf. 
even as night falls. Elsa and Anna stumble across the sad snowman and reveal to him that they have discovered what their tradition is. As we learn what is in the box are various cards and straw man animated of Olaf as gifts for Elsa, which was the only thing that kept them connected during those years apart. And yes, they do play Do You Want to Build a Snowman during this because they will not rest until I am an emotional wreck lying on the floor. And considering this moment is the crux of the entire special, they absolutely stuck the landing. This is the most wholesome and adorable thing ever that so brilliantly ties into the first movie way more than any of the other callbacks and truly makes this a main part of the Frozen story rather than just an optional side quest. But we still have one more song to get through before we wrap things up called When We're Together, which is so saccharine and overly sentimental and full of generic fluff, but it fills my heart with joy. And hey, if you can't be saccharine at Christmas, when can you be? It's the most standard holiday song of the bunch in that it gives me heavy Faith Hill singing Where Are You Christmas vibes. And just to throw on one more little tangent, if you haven't seen the music video of Faith Hill singing Where Are You Christmas from the 2001 movie Dr. Seuss How the Grinch Stole Christmas starring Jim Carrey, do yourself a favour. It's one of the most insane, questionable, and over-the-top music videos I have ever seen, yet for some reason it always gets me in the festive mood. Rise and shine. Back to the song, it's so warm and loving that you can't help but be taken in by it. During the number, everyone gathers on the lake as Elsa whips up some festive sculptures and furniture and they let Olaf put the star on top of the tree because that was the last box we had to tick off for Christmas special bingo. The hawk drops the fruitcake and thanks to Olaf, Erendelle has a new tradition as Elsa and Anna finally got to their big kingdom-wide Christmas party. And yeah, it's a little weird and unconventional, but it's also incredibly sincere and endearing, which is the best way to describe this special overall. Olaf's Frozen Adventure has gotten an incredibly unfair rap over the years purely because of greedy executive decisions that have tarnished what is ultimately something harmless and very entertaining. Olaf's Frozen Adventure isn't going to blow you away with some complex, multi-layered narrative that examines the character's psyche. It probably isn't going to become an all-time classic you're legally obligated to watch every year, but it's comfortable. It's a cosy little story about the importance of family traditions that ties in so expertly to the first movie and franchise as a whole. Sometimes you don't need something challenging that makes you ponder the questions of the universe. Sometimes you just want an endearing story with characters we know, pretty visuals, and some catchy tunes that perfectly capture the special feeling this time of year elicits. And if you need something like that, I highly recommend Olaf's Frozen Adventure. Somehow I find myself putting it on every December, and every time I do, I just end up falling in love with it all over again. Let's be real. These past two years have been very tough on pretty much everyone, and even now the uncertain times aren't over, and perhaps they never will be. But even with everything, the holidays still remain a constant, a month of respite at the end of the year that rejuvenates and jubilates us before we start all over again. We make it through a year of atrocities, division and fear, only to be given a quick refresher on everything that's good about the world. A reminder of everything we have and what we have to hold on to because it's all only temporary. It does only come once a year after all. If you happen to be new around here, feel free to subscribe and comment down below as it helps me out a whole lot. Also, liking the video wouldn't hurt either. And as always, a huge massive thank you to the wonderful, beautiful soul Kayla Babington for supporting me over on Patreon. If you want to support the future of this channel and me as a creator, you can do so by heading over and becoming a member of my Patreon, which will be linked in the description and comments down below. But of course, it's entirely optional, and I greatly appreciate every single person who watches and enjoys my content. But before I go, I just want to say thanks. Thanks to each and every one of you for making this year even slightly more bearable. Thanks so much for watching, folks, and I'll see ya real soon.